Welcome to the Coffee with Karen podcast, a weekly chat show discussing everything from holistic health to current affairs, from a mental, physical, and spiritual perspective. Get your weekly cup of positivity with a sprinkling of woo-woo. And welcome to the show. This is going out on Meatwave radio station. So you can just ask Alexa or you can go to the website forward slash midwave hyphen radio to listen in live or to see our schedule. Uh, if you're listening or watching the podcast, again, website forward slash podcast hyphen network to see this one and any other podcast in the, in the uh, network. You can download the app for Apple and Android. Please subscribe to any that take your fancy, follow and feel free to leave a comment. So today's episode is 118 and today we have Michelle who is a counsellor and Reiki master. Now we're going to be talking about the alchemy of trauma and mindfulness. Now my name's Karen Roberts, I am your host. We provide a platform for coaches, consultants, therapists and healers to get their message heard to the people that need to hear it, either through the radio station, Mintwave Radio, or Raising Vibrations Podcast Network. We also have a directory, so come and find the right fit for you. What do you need right now to get you to your next level? So Michelle has a master's in social work. She's a bachelor's in disability studies and is a Reiki master. Michelle offers counselling and education opportunities from a holistic, trauma-informed perspective. Now, she aims to create wellness and balance through the integration of traditional counselling and mindfulness techniques. This approach has developed through her own journey of having an autoimmune condition, uh, trauma and anxiety. She offers practice and discussions that can guide us to live a more fulfilled and authentic experience with self-compassion. She also believes strongly that trauma is a universal human experience that affects the body, mind and spirit. She believes that addressing our suffering leads to a journey that is beautiful, painful and ultimately reconstructs our fundamental meaning of compassion, humanity and our place in the world. So, Wow, Michelle, thank you so much for being on the show. If you'd like to share with the audience a little bit about, I mean, that's 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 quite a uh, quite a bio you've got there, but how did you come to be doing what you're doing right now? Yeah. I don't think it's any accident that anyone's our purpose and what we do through our own experience and our own. And so I would say that even from a very young girl, I was a highly sensitive person path and I had no idea what to do as most of us don't. And so my dad has been his entire life. Um, and so I entered grief fairly early, but not from the typical you would experience it. So when we think about trauma, we're often thinking about, you know, racism, natural disasters, war, abuse of all sorts of different kinds. But for me, it really comes to this holistic experience of trauma as a universal experience. I, at three, did not have the language or coping strategies to understand my dad's illness and the impact that that had on my life. And that really developed into me being overly empathic, um, people pleasing, taking care of other people, being perfectionist, being very good little girl. And then as I went forward in my, I also have an instance of sexual abuse in my past. And I also was bullied from the age of 10 until about 17. And there was this sense that I was a really high strung person. And it wasn't till later that I realized that this was experience in the world and my lack of ability to have coping around that. And so trauma really is just essentially anything that overwhelms our ability to cope. And so it wasn't until I got diagnosed with the autoimmune condition that I was like, okay, hold the phone. We've got to do something different about this. And this 
is when I discovered Reiki and energy work. And I started to learn how to deal with my own energy system. I started to learn what was mine and what was other people's. I started to kind of get free from that anxiety pattern as a way to keep myself safe. And I really discovered that that came through some semblance of being able to have some self-compassion and self-love, which I don't think I actually really had before that. And so when I use the words alchemy of trauma and healing, I think we get this idea that healing is this joyful, ecstatic place. (laughs) And it can be, but we've got to go through that dark night of the mix, the magic of your story and the meaning that you've put on your story. And you've got to mix that with what you want in the world so that we can come out the other side of this place of healing. It doesn't just finish. And healing also is something that we arrive at once and yay, we're done and we never need again, right? We're constantly looking at our stories again and understanding them through a level. And the deeper we go, the more we heal. But our society doesn't really want to do that if it involves any of called bad emotions or talking about our stuff. Whereas when we talk about our stuff, and you probably know this, Karen, when we're vulnerable in our stories, so many people say, oh, I've had that experience. And when we give languaging and we share that, we can collectively heal it as a community, which is why podcasts are lovely. Right, because we hear someone else's story and we do belong because someone else has a story that resonates with me. We are connected through story and the stories we tell and make. Yeah, sure. I, yeah, and then because that's it, I suppose people always think that it's just them and they're going through it alone. So, yes, by hearing other people's stories, they realize that they're not alone, it's not just them going through it. Yeah, and that we and we need to break this idea that like good people have good emotions, and you know if you're just all love and light, I think what's hard about the spiritual community is like if we just go into, I, I like what you about a sprinkle in the woo woo because a sprinkle of woo woo is really nice, but it also keeps us grounded because we've got around that love and light with some aware that we also can lie we. Can, manipulate we can also you know and show these other parts of ourselves that it's like but we all have what made you then um obviously you know you you've been through your own healing journey yourself what made you realize that okay now you're gonna move on and go into this as a career um I think from a, a little girl I always wanted to be a social worker and my mom would often say well I'm not sure if you can actually handle that hun it's a lot of emotions you're pretty sensitive not sure if you really want to do it so I ended up taking a few detours along the way I went into a an undergraduate in music an undergrad in disability studies that ended up doing my masters in social work but I think Probably from even kindergarten on, I was always the person who wanted to help everybody. I sort of can't help myself. And so (laughs) it's only been, and and I guess within not being able to help myself, I'm learning in my 40s as well how to have some boundaries around that. Because I think one of the coping strategies that comes out of my own trauma is that people pleasing is wanting to really help everyone. And so needing to really come to a balanced perspective there with some boundaries around I can't fix this for everybody. Um, I need to have some boundaries mm. as well, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, it's it's interesting, isn't it? That so many of what we might call our personality traits have actually stemmed from some trauma, and 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 yeah, trauma doesn't necessarily mean that. Yeah, you've 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 been through war torn, um, you know, situations. It could be simply. A teacher saying something to you when you were yeah. you were six, you know, it, it had an effect on you at that time. But isn't that funny that you you've then come to realize that your people pleasing, wanting to do do do, might actually be related to something that was traumatic in your period. I mean, yeah. it's such a complex situation. It is, and this is where we get into that post traumatic growth sort of place that we can take 
the brilliant strategies that we came up with at the time that maybe don't work for us now and and turn that into the alchemy of healing and trauma where that trauma does inform then how can we be better in the world because i think most of us can think of those situations that once we've survived them there is this on and i learned so much about myself they're not comfortable at the time most of us would say you know i could have lived without having that traumatic experience but the fact of the matter is it usually makes us more empathetic it usually makes us more compassionate it usually brings deeper understanding of who we are in the world and what will what will tolerate and what we won't tolerate right so we often think about trauma symptoms as well as like, you know, addictions, mental health, but it is those more subtle things too, like people pleasing or perfectionism or the, the things that we all try to do to regain control of our world. Mm. Yeah, it, it's, it's just such a fascinating subject because, you know, on the face of it, you might not realise that something that happened way back then is still having an effect on you now because it's it's obviously none of this is is conscious. So for you, how did you realise that, you know, some things were, were 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 happening due to something that happened in, in your past? Yeah, I think some of one of the gifts of being a therapist is you're always training in new techniques. And anytime you train in a new technique, you're constantly applying it to your own life as well. <laughs> and so there's that. So I was doing more traditional counseling, training, doing all sorts of things. I was doing eye movement therapies at the time. And then I was also doing Reiki. So I think the marriage of the two together, the psychology allowed me to intellectually understand what was happening and create a story. And then the Reiki allowed me to understand how it was stored in my body and how the patterns mm -hmm. of that energy really interact and intersect with those things. And I don't think this ever comes as an epiphany, right? I think we often think it will come as an epiphany and it doesn't. It's like we're wandering around gathering little pieces of information as we go and then they all sort of culminate together in that alchemy and we go oh I understand now I understand mm. you know what my child didn't understand and we start we can start to have these conversations with our inner child about how they did a very very good job in keeping us safe but that we have more skills and strategies now we have adult knowledge that 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 inner child did not have, right? Mm. And then, but, but how do you, I mean, is that, how does this all work? I mean, is it just one conversation you need to have with your inner child or <laughs> does this need to be gotten and again? Because our minds are such complex things and, and anything that we've been doing habitually, depending on how old we are when we come to do the healing process, you think, right, well, can this, can this all be dealt with straight away or... Do we need to revisit it? Because, you know, if, if, it, if it takes a long time to create a new habit for anything, when it comes to the healing process, is can it be just done and dusted in one, one sitting or does it need to be done consistently? I mean, I know it's all yeah. a bit of a journey. I wish, probably I wish <laughs> it could be said, it could be done and dusted. That would be amazing. But at the same time, the healing journey allows us to constantly know ourselves in better ways. So even if I'm 90 years old, I still want to be discovering things about myself that surprise me. It keeps life interesting. So I do think it's a journey. And I do think if we think about these multiple parts of ourselves, right, we have a six-year-old within us that's scared. We have a 14-year-old within us that's angry and angsty, right? We have, we have multiple parts. We have the parts of us that are angry or anxious or people-pleasing. And then there's the wholeness of who we are at our core, our self or our soul that is intact and is always intact no matter what happens, right? And oh, so we need to constantly, I think for myself, I'm constantly having conversations with the other younger parts of myself and kind of getting them up to speed. <laughs> like, you know, I know we used to do that pattern, right? But we don't really need to do it anymore. So for me, it often shows up in eating patterns. So the more out of control I feel, the more anxious that I am, the more I will default to controlling my food. So wow. now, okay. so in my 20s and 30s, I would have been proud of this. I would have been like, oh, look how much I can restrict my food. <laughs> in my 40s, wow. 
I have conversations with myself about, ah, okay, this is your early warning sign that things aren't in balance. You are obviously wow. not feeling like you're in control, Michelle, because you are looking to want to control your food. The difference being that I don't. So I'm watching myself mm. and the impulse to want to go to that old pattern. And then I right. choose not, I choose not to. Right. So you're getting an outside view. In. Yes. It's almost like you're yes. taking a step back to look in at what it is you're doing. Um, but but what, what I mean, because most people will just do and it's just on yeah. autopilot. So what was the difference with you? How did you come to that point where you could actually, whoa, stop, yeah. take a step back and look in at your own life and what you're doing? Yeah, I think this came when I started doing eye movement desensitization. So EMDR therapy, where you're you're looking at your patterns of beliefs about yourself with in conjunction with visualizations of trauma, and then you're moving your eyes back and forth. And I did have an epiphany when I was doing this eye movement therapy. So I had this epiphany and I started laughing in the middle of therapy because I was like, oh my God, the sexual abuse had nothing to do with me. It had zero to do with me. I was just available at the time. It wasn't anything that I did. It wasn't anything that I asked for. It had actually zero to do with my own wounding. And I burst out laughing with this realization. There was this sense of freedom. And after Ooh. that, I felt like I could, from a bird's eye view, look at my patterns and say, okay, this is why I'm doing this. And can I choose something else to do instead? Now, do I get it right all the time? No, I still get anxious. I still have a nervous system. I still have fight or flight. So there are times where for sure I will indulge in the anxiety. I will indulge in not feeling like I'm good enough. I will indulge in all the like, you know, hard emotions of life. Mm -hmm. But, you know, at least 50% of the time I can watch myself do it and say, would I like to choose something different or do I want to go choose the old thing? And sometimes my 14 year old is like, <laughs> no. But you are going to go and you are going to be anxious and you're going to wallow around and you're going to pout as much as you humanly want to because that's what we want to do right now. So that's right. okay too because I think that's part of the healing journey as well as we don't just suddenly become this enlightened human who has something figured out that other people don't have figured out. None of us is more are more yeah. special than anyone else and we're all uniquely yeah. special. Oh, I love that. Yes, 100%. Absolutely. There's why are we so hard on ourselves? I don't know. I think because I think we're not taught self compassion. And I think if we go back to this sort of religious historical teachings of how we were in the world, like this would not have been, it, you would not have been humble. There would have been some idea that if you relaxed, you wouldn't be working hard enough or something. I don't know. It's some sort of Protestant work mm. ethic, religious thing. I don't know. Whereas it's like, no, but if you're, compassionate to yourself you can more authentically show up as who you are you feel like you can belong more and you feel like you can then actually get support from other people because there's not this shameful piece about saying you know none of us want to admit we get angry or anxious but all of us get angry and anxious mm. yes well I mean and like like you said earlier about the I think you know this is something that I see is you know I think people misinterpret the self-development arena or because it's not all fluffy clouds mm. and unicorns and <laughs> no you gotta go splash <laughs> around in the mud and get dirty sometimes <laughs> yeah right you know all this positive thinking it's it's I get it I get what they're trying to do but it's actually the best step is to accept mm -hmm. At full because, acceptance of yeah. what is, so yeah. you're not resisting it because whatever you resist against, you'll persist. Yeah. So if you're just yeah. faking it, yeah. So we can't exile, you can't exile parts of yourself. You can't say, This part of me belongs in the world, but I don't want that part, right? Like, because it does, it, resi it gets louder and louder and it creates disease in our body, it creates mental you know, mental health concerns, because you're, instead of saying and owning, I'm angry, I'm anxious, I'm working through something, right? You're, you're banishing that part of you instead of, and I don't know why humanity does this, because we can't, we're no more can we feel joy all the time than can we feel anger all the time. 
But we get this idea that if we choose to be angry, we're just going to live there. Whereas if we choose to be joyful, we'll live there, which is just not true. We are constantly ebbing and flowing through like thousands of emotions every single day. None of them yeah. are set point, right? Yeah. Well, you know, if you're, that's a flat line, isn't it? You're dead if you're yeah. going <laughs> to yeah. That can't be the goal. You don't want to be staying yeah. steady all, all yeah. the way. You know, that is life. If you, You're not going to appreciate the ups if you don't come down. It's, yeah. but, it, but again, it's, there's so much negativity given to that you know if you're up and down you're bipolar or you're this or you're that or yeah. you know there's all these labels now put on things that you can't what you can't control your emotions but is it is is it that I mean uh with regards to the sort of uh, the way mental health issues are being treated is it the right way or well, you know I all these about... labeling people yeah, and I think it's about everybody has their journey. So I found it through things like tapping and acupuncture and Reiki and EMDR. Someone else f- might find that through marathon running or journaling or like we all, there's no one size fits all. So for some people, that diagnosis is a huge amount of relief. It gives them a languaging to understand their experience. And the medication that comes with that might also give them this huge relief that allows them to be more themselves. There's also other people though, where that's not the answer for them. And I don't like this duality that we have, which is you have to choose diagnosis and medication, or you have to choose some sort of alternative holistic thing. To me, they can exist together and we can have equal respect for for both roots, depending on what's right for each individual person. Oh, can you please be in charge? <laughs> I've always said this. I mean, yeah, everybody fighting amongst themselves, like my way is the right way, and my well, I suppose that's probably the problems, the whole problems of the planet, aren't they? Yes. Um, with any with any subject, there everyone's arguing over who's right and who's wrong. Whereas we're all right and we're yeah. all wrong, depending on who the individual person is and what is the right thing for yeah. them because we're too complex. Yeah. Like you said, you know, you don't know what trauma they've been through. You don't know what circumstance it was under. One person's is going to be completely different to the next person's yeah. and how they've reacted yeah. or responded to it. Yeah. And you and I could live through exactly the same experience and have completely different ways of, of dealing with that. Yes. And We also get to change our minds. So when we get into this, like, I'm right, you're wrong, this way is right, this way is wrong, there's also then shame if we change our minds. Mm. So it's like, oh, now I can't admit that I want to jump camp and join the other camp, right? (laughs) Versus saying, you know, it's like you say, it's all right and it's all wrong depending on the time, depending on the person. Whereas if we didn't oh, make yeah. people choose a camp, then we could also change our mind and say, I have more information now than I did have five years ago. I understand myself differently than I did five years ago. So now I need a different approach. Absolutely. I mean, well, I know that my p- whole perception on everything has changed in the last, well, probably throughout throughout my whole life at different stages. So yeah, yeah. isn't that the whole point? We continue to learn. Um, yeah challenge our belief systems so we're gonna I mean and if you really have had exactly the same view on life throughout your life oh man that's not a good thing because you're not growing so yeah yeah, there is so we're we're, we're in when we realize that we're all individuals we're all having completely different experiences and we are all going to have different reactions to the same thing because that's who we are. We're human. Yeah. And then we and then we also have this need, which is which is very real, that when we get the excitement of healing, we also feel like we need to <laughs> foist it on everybody else. Right? Yes. It's like, oh, yes. have you tried this, this, and this? This is how I healed. You need to do the same thing. Which also isn't yes. true. So we also get this in this excitement of our own healing. We do feel like we need to impose that on other people too. Uh, yes. versus just allowing everyone to have their journey. And I think this comes from some trauma too, that we, that it's actually incredibly violent. If we take this stance of nonviolence, 
the stance of nonviolence means we're not forcing anyone else to heal either. So it's incredibly violent to come into someone else's life and say, you should do A, B, and C, and you will be fixed. (laughs) Versus walking alongside them and letting it unfold and giving people the free will to say, that's not for me right now. I'm not in a place where I can heal that. And that doesn't mean them, it doesn't make them less of a human because they're not ready to look at something. Right. Right. And I suppose I'm sure they do it in a, you know, it's it's from a place of wanting to help. Yes. I totally get that. I think they get some get so caught up in what's happened. And I suppose that's, you know, it's quite nice that they want to go and help other. But, yeah, I don't know about you, but I don't like being told what to do. No. And I suppose it's about asking permission, right? Because here's the thing is, and this comes from my people pleasing and my caretaking, because I'm like, you know, suddenly I'm asking my neighbor, oh, do you want me to do this for you? She hasn't even asked. So it's okay to wait. Because I think caregivers and empaths, because we can also see the hurt in the world we want the hurt in the world to go away we do sometimes jump in as well and say you should fix this because I can see what needs fixing in you um Mm. but nobody's asked and then you end up being resentful and tired because you're around fixing everybody else's stuff when nobody's asked you to fix it for them and that's got to be exhausting yeah versus you know really coming back to ourselves and our own energy coming home to our own body and saying I'm here for you and just holding space for that right right and like I mean like so now I mean I don't know too much about Ray K I joke because I'm a bit of a I say I cheat I've got my frequency devices because I, yes. I, I don't know how to do it I haven't learned how to do it but you know, it's all about energy, but, uh, and it's interesting that you just mentioned there that, you know, you know, people go in and, and, and doing all this stuff. No wonder people are tired mm-hmm. all the time, but when they realize that, how, how would you um, suggest that somebody could actually recharge their own batteries? Yes. Well, even though you are not attuned to Reiki, I would argue that every single one of us is an intuitive being who knows and reads energy. Absolutely. I I would totally agree. So if your thoughts are racing and you can't get off of that thought, then you're unbalanced. You're not grounded. If your heart is racing and you're feeling anxious and you can't actually take a breath, then you're not, you're not embodied within yourself. Right? So, but most of us get taught and praised for powering through that. Well, look how intellectual she is. Look how busy she is. Look how much amazing, amazing things she's doing in the world. So we get really reinforced for the disease of busyness in our world. It's praised, right? Yes. Oh, I was a whole, I'm busy being busy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Not so very productive. <laughs> we don't get listen, to, taught to listen to our gut, to take a breath, to slow those thoughts down. So one of the quickest, easy, because I'm also about, let's be lazy about it. This should be something you should do on the run. So I'm a person who loves to meditate for like an hour a day, but I understand that lots of people don't like to do that and don't have time for that. So I'm also a huge proponent of do it on the run. One of my favorite things to do is to tap under my collarbones and just repeat my name. I am Michelle Agopswich and only Michelle Agopswich. And I call all of my energy back. And I'll say that three times. And I find it just centers you, it grounds you, it comes back into your body so that you're like, just pause. Because what we know scientifically as well is that if we can take three to five diaphragmatic, nice breaths, lower the shoulders, take a breath, that's enough. Mm. we don't have to be questing unless you want to along this meditative journey right meditation can be mindfulness it can be you're walking with intention you're driving with intention you're listening to a music with intention versus well I'm going to listen to a podcast and scroll through my phone and send emails with this like I'll somehow multitask we're not being mindful in that 
And yeah, mindfulness sure. can be pausing for 30 seconds and coming home to ourselves. Mm, yeah, I, I, I suppose that is part of the problem, maybe, that people's, again, perception of what they need to do. Oh, meditate for an hour. I haven't got time for this. But like you say, it doesn't have to be long. And 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 what I've sort of come to realise, again, whether it's right or wrong, but what I'm seeing for myself personally is all this, you know, there's a time for meditating and you're almost trying to get out there somewhere, you know, trying mm. to almost escape your body. But actually, I found that actually coming within actually focusing really being in the body and actually being fully conscious so not in a meditative trying to drift off into a sleep mode but almost like an awake meditation right. really You're trying awake. to actually be more present versus this idea that meditation is checking out because i don't i'm not thinking yes. about not that i haven't i use meditation as bypassing at times like if i'm really stressed i'm like no i'm going to go to escape to the ethers fall asleep and I'll be happy. Right. But, but I'm aware that I'm doing that meditation and mindfulness is also exactly say coming back, just coming back to the present moment and being like, okay, can I, can I quiet my thoughts or at least watch my thoughts for five seconds? Because we're, again, we're not trying to banish anything. We're not trying to say, because the more you try to meditate and stop your thoughts, the more you're like shaming yourself about, well, my thoughts didn't stop and now my breath isn't okay. And, you know, like <laughs> that's not what we're trying to accomplish. We're just watching the experience of being in a body, which most of us get very out there. And I'm also going to say, you're never going to master meditation or mindfulness. You're mindful until you're not, and then you're mindful again. Love that. And very true. Yeah. It's almost like we're looking. Everyone's looking out there to find enlightenment, to perfect yeah. their meditation. And yeah. Just, and do you think like, the, do you think the Dalai Lama doesn't get a little bit annoyed once in a while? Do you think sometimes he doesn't sit in meditation and you know, he's sort of just rambling on, I can guarantee you he is, right? And so yeah. it, it gets easier over time, we get better at it, it gets easier to stay in the present moment, because we're consciously intentionally paying attention to it. But uh, you can't bypass being a human. No. I, I Yeah, because that's, yeah, otherwise, you're going to spend your whole time just, <laughs> what I sort of call it dancing between the the sort of unthinking, be, like being in the moment, but you can't stay there the whole time because there's stuff, still stuff to do, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then yeah. <laughs> you can't spend your time in the meditation either because, again, nothing will – there is this – there are things to do, so the balance between unthinking, thinking, doing – <laughs> throughout your day <laughs> has got to yeah. be has got to be the way to go it can't you can't otherwise yeah what what are you going to do yeah well i think also balance isn't a set point either like if you think about it as a scale right like we we hit balance and then we tip the other side and then we hit balance and we tip mm. the other side right and so it's okay versus this well i should be doing this and i shouldn't be doing that and kind of what ah. i say like stop shitting all over yourself and yeah. get to this and place, right? This self-compassion of saying, you know, and I sometimes like um, Jack Kornfield's meditation about just like me. So that person's trying to get through that grocery line quicker, just like me. That person's trying to accomplish something just like me. That person's trying to be the best parent they can, just like me. That person's trying to be enlightened, mm -hmm. just like me right? That person's trying to cut me off in traffic, just like me, because we also have the human condition means that all those things that annoy us about other people, we're doing too, right? We're standing in the grocery yeah. line being like, why won't you move quicker? Why are you doing a price check right now? Right? <laughs> we're all doing that all the time while we're also trying to be some sort of enlightened, right? Yeah. And then, and then we're feeling guilty if we're not, mm -hmm. if yeah. we're not staying calm throughout. So really what I'm hearing from what you're saying is we need to be a little bit kinder to ourselves. Yeah, first we of do. All. And that's hard because nobody teaches us self-compassion. 
Mm. Right? Well, it's because- seen it, it was always seen as being, you know, you've got to be hum you, you know, you don't you don't pat yourself yeah. on the back, you don't blow your own trumpet, you don't all yeah. these things that we've been taught. Yeah, not there's to this do, idea. Actually, yeah, there's this idea that our ego will run rampant, which it yeah. which it won't, right? It won't for most of us, right? <laughs> well, I've done this and I've done this, and I've done I mean, no, you're not gonna you just sort of acknowledge it I suppose acknowledge the things that have gone well even acknowledge the things that you know it is what it is but again yeah we've been brought up to to believe that in some way and I don't know where do you think that comes from I think it is I think unfortunately it probably does have its basis in religion in some way right like there's Mm. and and perhaps man's interpretation of religion right this idea that if we don't if you know if we're if you're you know like we have all these sins of you know laziness and not being humble and all of this so versus saying okay but most of us are incredible like I haven't it's very hard to find people who aren't humble actually most people are humble and most people actually have a difficulty receiving right if somebody comes up to you and, and says Karen I love your show you know, it's yeah. very hard to say, thank you, I'm very it proud is. of it. Most of us now, want to say, you... thank you, but did you notice yes. that the audio recording of that wasn't very good today? Like most of us have this need to interject a yeah, but. Yeah. Now, it's interesting you say that because my, it's funny, perceptions, right? And and whereabouts are you based? I'm in Canada. So, I would, we would say that side of the world, Canadians, Americans, um, are very much, they would take uh, compliments a little bit more. And I would say us Brits are terrible about taking. um, I would say Canadians are terrible about it (laughs) for the most part. Like I think, well, because we have, I mean, we're still part of the Commonwealth too. I think Canadians classically, we we apologize for our existence. We're just I'm sorry, I'm sorry, yeah, I'm sorry, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, true. And we say like thank you for everything, right? So anytime I've traveled internationally, it's like why are you saying thank you for the fork and then the knife and then the plate and then the serve? Like <laughs> we do have this tendency to sort of to over to over apologize and over gratitude everything. But I think yeah. you know yes, if we consider it like the new world which isn't so you know Americans can I think we do have a little bit more of that like we've gone out to have this pioneering spirit and reinvent ourselves sort of thing um but Mm. not to get dark and heavy but I also want to say that that's on the back of colonialism and completely you know taking over someone else's land so, you know, true, our could be generational, generational yeah. sort of trauma going yes. on there as well. We have um, huge intergenerational trauma because we have a bunch of settlers who've left for whatever trauma mm-hmm. reason to come to another country. But in that process, we've also stripped the indigenous people of their culture and their way of being in a genocide and have said, we're now taking over your land. So, you know, as much ah. as we might be polite and receiving and all of these things, we, we also have this thing we have to admit, which is, you know, that there our country is based on racism and genocide. Wow. That's quite, yeah, that now that's a deep thought. And, and I bet a lot of that will be unconscious, you know, it's going to be unconscious, isn't yeah. it? So yeah. it's, it's quite, yeah, yeah, it's so quite interesting it, when you look back and you think, wow, yeah. where could that come from? And it can mm. be dualistic in that way, too, because I think people say, yes, but Canadians are also very kind. Well, it's, yes, we can be very kind and also these other places, right, that we these dark, yeah, dirty course. places. And, and we have we to all. all acknowledge that. Right. And, you know. Yeah, most As we, you know, we, like, we try to pretty it up too much yeah we do and I suppose when we accept that the the yin and the yang the Chinese got it right yeah. didn't they yeah uh, the yin and yang we've got both yeah both there and you know it's 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 we, we've got to get back to some balance but so do you do any work with generational trauma because I can't I find would, it, well I would it. argue that everything is generational trauma Right. Okay. So, yes, yeah. we have. So if you want to muddy the waters, you know, each of us has an experience at like three years old that shapes who we are today. 
but lots of the patterns we get are also from our moms or our dads, or who knows if that started back at our great grandma or, you know, great, great grandfather. If we look at the history within our families of addiction, mental health, or, or the patterns they run through families. We right. learn that, right? There's and a is that, is that going to be, is that, but is that going to be genetic in the DNA or is that more the nurture side? So for instance, so I'm a, um, I was adopted as a baby. I was brought up with white parents. Um, but then my, my father was, and I only know this through DNA was Irish and my mother was a mix of West Indian. So there could be, so even though I wasn't brought up with my biological mother, with their whatever generation, you know, that would have been, they would have been taken to yep. the West Indies as slaves. Could that affect you now from the DNA? Because I wasn't brought up with it, so I didn't know mm. any about it. I had a very different upbringing. So would mm. I have? <laughs> yeah. It's such so a we're, fascinating subject. It is, because, but we do have this nature-nurture thing, this genetic. And so when we look at this idea, and this is really just an evolving field right now within epigenetics, right? There is this idea that some of these patterns are passed down. So sometimes when we look at Holocaust survivors, they're starting to do studies of multiple generations after Holocaust survivors that have traits of that genetically and from that nurture perspective, right? And wow. so lots of us don't know, but the more we, like going back to this, the more we talk about it without shame, the more we say, mm. yes, this was my past. So I think what comes up when we talk about intergenerational trauma or racism, most of us want to say, I'm not racist, but, or I don't see color, which just isn't true. Whereas if you say, I'd like to be curious about your experience in the world and I want to understand it, then I can heal some of those things that my ancestors have done, some of the things that other people's ancestors, and we can come into the, again, the alchemy of healing which is the more positive interactions we have with people, the more likely we are to be able to have a productive healing conversation about that versus you're racist or not. Yeah, Your ancestors did this or not. That's And oh, I think man. this is the argument that happens. It's like, well, my ancestors weren't part of, you know, like I, my generation yes. had nothing to do with slavery. Okay. But yes. our culture is built still on the legacy of yes. that. And of course. so, we all need to acknowledge the privilege we have gained as a result of that. And if we can say that, then we can start having healing conversations versus this yeah. the more we deny it. It's the same as exiling the anxious or angry parts of ourselves. We now exile the angry, anxious, destructive parts of our past as a collective yes. too, right? Rather than accepting, uh, just accepting it and acknowledging it. I suppose yeah. everybody wants to. It's like, you know, that we have these shows of uh, where they go back and do into their family mm -hmm. tree. It's almost like everybody you know, or, or the same as people want to do past life regression. They all want to be, they all want to have yes. been Cleopatra. Right. Or, Nobody wants to be Henry VIII. <laughs> Genghis Khan. <laughs> no. But we all have, but we all have this within us. We all have the capacity yes. to heal. We all have the capacity to hurt, right? Yeah. And and we're all, you know, we're not gonna be, I suppose everybody wants to have this perfect background, family tree of these yeah. wonderful people that they've all done good and yeah. it ain't gonna be no. all sunshine and roses. Cool, my Everybody's background, got... it might have been one lot and then one lot. Yeah. They might have been so I mean it's yeah. just right. it's just Everybody crazy when you say look. right I don't have any murderers I don't have any mental health I don't yeah. have any addictions I have no slave traders right and it's just not you know like we're all gonna have I've probably got both mm -hmm. on both sides yeah. right <laughs> and then you know there's the energetics of that right and and it's about yeah. saying okay but can we have an because if we can have an open honest curious conversation curious. then we can and that's, then that's we can it. disarm it but if we yes. continue to but, dig our heels in and say that doesn't exist in my world, it yeah. just gets more and more. Yeah, it was done. That happened a long time yeah. ago. What are you still going on over? 
Yeah. It, it's a shame, really. It's a shame, it really, because it's not, again, it's not this blame that we're not blaming. No. Yes, this happened a long time ago. We just need to. Yeah. I agree with you. It just needs to be yeah. uh, spoken about rather than being glittered with yeah. gold dust as though, no, it was yeah. perfect. Look, but trust I, me, you know, yeah. oh. <laughs> Yeah, I and I think we have quite a lot. <laughs> yeah, and I think we do have collective shame or an unconscious collective shame around those things, right? Or even, mm. you know, I think we we hero worship sometimes too, right? Like people come to me and they're like, you know, well, you're a therapist. That must mean you have your whole life sorted out. So then they're surprised, you know, like I have lots of people say, Well, you don't probably don't fight with your partner though, because you're a therapist. And I'm like, but I'm a human being who needs to sort out things. Like Yes, we fight. Yes, I get anxious. Yes, I get irritated. I'm human just like everyone else, right? But I think we have this tense sense to hero or other people as well, which also, again, gives mm. our energy away. So we're looking for some other yeah. guru or expert or somebody to come along and, and for us to aspire to be them. But yeah, no, everybody's on equal pedestals at different yeah, places. Yeah, it's all within. Time. Yeah. It's all yeah. within you. You've, yeah. We've all got the same, we've got the same access to it, just some of us shut it off. Yeah. And we all want the same thing, which is basically contentment, joy, self-love. Like we're all, we're all want, you know, we're to spread, to spread healing in the world in whatever way that I think we all do that, whether you're an engineer whose passion is to provide safe buildings I don't have the ability for that to be my healing in the world, right? Um, yeah, sure. We all have, we are all healers in our own way. Yeah. We're sparking and lighting people up in our own ways throughout the world. But we forget, we forget that we're shiny too. <laughs> yeah. We get all tarnished, we need right? More sh- yeah. <laughs> well, I think we just, we just sort of, Again, it's just we're conditioned to be too hard on ourselves and we don't mm. sort of give ourselves that pat on the back and say, well done. And yeah. it's, it's uh, yeah, we, we just focus on the things that didn't go right. We're just conditioned for yeah. that. On a, You know, when yeah. people talk about you've got to have gratitude and that, yeah, we, 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 it's very easy to get complacent. Yeah. Right. And it's then very we also easy have this striving. Out which the Buddhists talk about, right? Is like we strive for this thing and we get it. And literally like the next day, we're like, okay, what's the next Stop. thing? That's not enough anymore, right? I'm and now I'm on. So that's great because we're constantly striving for something different. It's also okay to pause and say, can I enjoy this for just one moment before Enjoying I'm discontented the because the next goal isn't coming fast enough, right? Yeah, but the Buddhists well, talk gratitude. about this a lot, right? It is. It's gratitude, yeah. and it's about slowing down. And I think our culture does have a disease of busyness. We don't slow down long enough to say, "I'm really proud of that," mm. and I did a really good job. And I don't have to chase the next hit yet, right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just be in, enjoying the moment because, yeah, look. Things go by way too quickly. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that mm-hmm. definitely for me is is massive. You know, my girls are nearly grown and empty nest as soon. And I can remember, you know, having when there were babies, people would say, oh, you know, <laughs> it, yeah. time's going to go fast. And yeah. You think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sh-. Yeah. And now here I am. <laughs> here I yeah. am. It's like, yeah. where did that go? Well, and there's this paradox yeah. of time because we we look back and we say, oh, I wish I'd appreciated that more. Like, I think most of us could say, why did I hate my 20 year old self? Because she was energetic <laughs> and, you know, beautiful and whatever. Right. But I think there's also the paradox because the older you get, the more you also can encompass and love who you are. You're like, this is who I am. This is who I'm becoming. And we're a bit more unapologetic about that, which is also lovely. So we we yearn for this younger self who didn't appreciate who they were. And we we also get better and better and better. Yes. Oh, definitely. And we don't, you know, if I could pass one thing on to my children, it would be to not worry what other people think of you. That's yeah. something definitely that's come from age. Yeah. yeah. No yeah. longer. It's not my my problem. That I can take yeah. me or leave me, <laughs> and it's not going to affect me. If I could yeah. pass it on to the younger, oh, oh man, no. you've got your life sorted, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
So to the listeners out there, what what is it you specifically, like I know you're a counsellor and you're a Reiki master, but what is it that you really love to do? Who do you like to help? What specifically is your goal of, of, of what problem are you solving? Yeah, I think probably the hardest problem that I'm solving is getting everybody to recognize their story. So what, like what I said about this universal trauma, what I love working with people more than anything is for people to say, you mean I don't need to feel any stigma about this story, about these experiences that I've had because I had never, would never have named it as trauma. So, and it seems counterintuitive because trauma seems like a really big word. So people say, well, I don't have trauma. I don't want to talk about trauma, any of these things. But then you lean into what the definition of it is and people go, I can actually acknowledge the impact that really, really had on me. And then my favorite people are the people who say, I want to learn my energy system. So it's the people who want to learn the trauma and how that impacts us. But then how does that show up in your energy system? How can you learn how to be grounded? How can you learn how to calm your system down? And I also love teaching. So I've got lots of self-study online courses as well, because I also have a real passion for teaching this stuff. And I want it to go mainstream and it is starting to go mainstream that we, we all have trauma and there's nothing wrong with that. And we don't need a diagnosis for every single thing. And we don't need to necessarily pathologize the human experience. I hope that answered your question. Mm. I think that's the crux of it, that we do not need to pathologize our humanity. Oh, yes. Uh, And that is, uh, I would say that's what's mm, slightly going wrong right now. The way I see things, and I get it, it's almost come from a good place because there wasn't any talk about mental yeah. health or anything. Now it seems to have gone totally the other side of things. And the danger is, is people are owning this thing that they've been labeled yeah. with. And then it's, it's, that's all they sort of almost talk about because they've, they've become the victim of uh, taken ownership of that, whatever mm-hmm. the ailment is rather than, Whereas- it's just a part of us. So depression is just yeah. a part of us, right? Yes, and yes, we might depressed. need medication, but it's not the entirety of who we are. And that does not in any way, shape or form minimize the experience of depression, which is heartrending. Yes. So in the mental health field, and maybe it'll take a little bit longer for this to catch up, I'm seeing it swing back into balance. So we had uh, nothing. Good. Then now yes. I'm seeing it. And that then I saw it swing into just everybody has a diagnosis in it. And now I'm seeing some swing back into, can we talk about the coping strategies that have come as a result that we needed to survive something at the time? And can we start having conversations with those parts to get them on board a little bit so that we're looking at ourselves as of a more holistic perspective. So I am seeing it um, so hopefully in the mainstream, it'll start to kind of come back into this middle ground where we can all say, yes, we've dep- been depressed at times. Yes, we're anxious at times. Or I do have clinical depression, but I'm also an incredibly productive person in the world. It doesn't it doesn't have to mean that we are no longer useful. You. It doesn't define us, right? It can take yeah. up a lot of space. And what we want to do is have it, the depression take up a little less space in your life, right? So I am seeing a little bit more balance. And one of the things I think that the pandemic was exciting for me is that suddenly everybody was talking about mental health. Instead of everybody pretending, oh, I'm fine and everything's good. It was, I'm good today. This week, I'm not. And I think there was a bit more of an open conversation about that. And I hope we get to some place where we talk about mental wellness, which to me just has a different... Ah. Yes, has different, just a totally different, different energy energy to it than mental health. Health, right? Yes. To me, mental yes, health 100%. has a stigma, and, and us as society stigma. need to work on the stigma because, of course, having mental health does not mean you're less of a person. But every single one of I us, whether that. you have a mental health diagnosis or not, should be talking about mental wellness because every single one of us 
have or don't have mental wellness on a daily basis. Absolutely. And 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 again, I suppose it's the talking about it to, to say, and it's okay. And you know, okay. if you wake up in a mood and you really don't feel like, yeah. it's okay. Yeah. And if you have five okay. years and if you have five years where you're in a depression and you're on medication and it feels like there's no hope, that's okay too. Right. Yes. That, that there's nothing wrong with that. You have not failed as a human. You don't deserve bad things. You didn't do anything wrong. There isn't something magical that everybody else has figured out that you don't. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love the, I love your outlook on it. Um, and I really hope there's more and more people that are going to have that outlook on it because yeah, this, this has got to be the way forward. This is the healing process, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Everybody's yeah, stopping do. so hard you, on yourself. Yeah. <laughs> and you get, you have it figured out till you don't, right? Like, you know, you might've been depressed in your twenties and then you're kind of okay. And then menopause hits and you get a little bump of depression there again. And then you're kind of okay. But then you know, you get some, you know, heaven forbid, some Alzheimer's something, some depression comes in there again, like versus yeah. this, but we have had this us versus them, the people who have mental health and people who don't. And historically, of course, there's a lot of fear around mental health and, and we just don't need to fear it anymore. Right. And, and yeah, and just say, you know, it's part of life. And I, you know, yeah. I challenge anybody that hasn't ever suffered, uh, bouts of depression, bouts of anxiety, bout otherwise, are they really human? <laughs> yeah. 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 I would I would challenge that. I'm gonna yes. challenge that one. <laughs> so, are you sure? Are you sure? I mean I have to say I you know I I think grief was a I was quite a feisty little, you know, deal with it kind of person. Come on. Yeah. And until something knocks you down and you have that realization that wow, this is not the stuffing out of me, mm -hmm. and actually just deal with it is not helping. <laughs> yes, and no amount of like knowledge or powering through or anything like no amount of theory is going to help move that grief and trauma through your body. No, 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 not at all. And so, yeah, I mean, it's like you said right at the beginning. It's all a journey. So how do people find you? It's been lovely speaking to you. And I can't believe how quickly the time's gone. How do the listeners get in touch with you? Yeah, you can go to my website at www.illuminatedpathcounseling.com. And I'm on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube at Illuminated Path Counseling, where I do little snippets of mental health, mental wellness things. And I have on my website um, some exciting online self-study courses that I'm just, I will say, I'm very proud of. <laughs> and Good. so please, stuff in the back. Um, but, but always a work in progress, but I am very proud of them. And so please come check me out wherever you want to find me. Fantastic. Awesome. Well, it has been wonderful speaking to you today. Thank you so much for your time. And to everybody else, uh, guys, if you're interested, if you are a coach out there and you want your own podcast, I want to come on and have a radio show on Mint Wave Radio Station. Get in touch. The website forward slash discovery if you want to book a call with me. Um, otherwise, I will be back tomorrow with a coffee with Karen. Bye for now. Coffee with Karen podcast, a weekly chat show discussing everything from holistic health to current affairs from a mental, physical and spiritual perspective. Get your weekly cup of positivity with a sprinkling of woo-woo.